Well, last week, we started a series entitled Family, Government, and the Church. And we discovered that God instituted these three governing functional entities in the earth, and he does have a plan for how all three are to function in the culture. God loves us so much that he gave us his word to guide and govern these three things. Now, sometimes God's word will affirm us because God loves us. And sometimes God's word will correct us because God loves us. But love does not always equal affirmation. That's where we are in the culture. If you don't affirm me, you don't love me. No, sometimes love will demand truth to set us free. And without the truth, we would all be bound and hopeless. So, last week we discovered there are systemic failures in the family, in the government, and in the church that results in chaos in the culture. Today, we're going to start with the first institution that God created, and that is the family. And I'd like to begin with a question. If all of society reflected your family, in what kind of world would we live? Well, let's just get everybody upset from the beginning. The truth is, society is first shaped in the home. The family is the first governing body that impacts the quality of any society. Last week, we talked about how God created male and female, and then he brought them into the union, and he blessed them, giving them uh, the command to multiply and fill the earth with his image. Look what it says in Genesis 1:28, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God blessed the family as he created it, to thrive in the earth. The Bible's filled with examples of marriage and family. Before you get out of Genesis, you see Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah. Throughout Israel history, you you find Isaac and Rebekah and Jacob and Rachel and so on. And the Bible is also filled with instructions of how to do family God's way. Now, the sad thing is, the family in America is failing. Biblical marriage is declining, and the general attitude toward marriage is that it's no longer necessary to live a fulfilled life. This flies in the face of what God said when man was alone. He said, this ain't good. This is not good. He's got to be fulfilled. I'll create the essential. Let me give you just some staggering statistics today. In 1970, 67% of Americans the age 25 to 49 were living with their spouse and at least one child. Today, that number's dropped from 67% to 37%. Today, 57% of men and 46% of women say having a career fulfills you. 16% of men, 17% of women say being married helps fulfill you. Today, 70% say that it's acceptable to cohabitate with no plans to marry. 49% of adults today are unmarried. 25% are 40-year-olds of 40-year-olds have never married. They are really good at playing video games in their mother's basement, but they're not married and never have been. Nearly 50% of all first-time marriages end in divorce, and by the third marriage, that goes up to 75%. So we see in general a decline not only in being married, but in the attitude toward marriage. But how is that affecting the children? 33 to 40% of children in America are in single parent family homes. Over 23 million kids just in this nation. Since 2019 is established, the US has the highest rate of children living in single parent households. A U.S. Census reports that 24.7 million children live without their biological father present. Children who grow up without their father uh, uh, present have a higher rate of mental health issues, anxieties, low self-esteem, depression, and behavioral issues. They are four times more likely to end up in poverty and are at a greater risk for substance abuse, teenage pregnancies, and becoming high school dropouts. That's how it's affecting the children. And I will tell you, 
that Satan is working in the culture against the family. So let's take a few moments and talk about Satan's plot against the family in today's culture. Now, these are not in any particular order. They just came as, as, I, as I followed the Lord through this study. The first is this, socialist Marxist policies. Karl Marx, in his infamous Communist Manifesto, called for the abolition of the family, the nuclear family, insert the word biblical family there, transferring educational and provisional responsibilities from the home to the government, i.e., things like the Department of Education come out of thinking like that. And now there is a push to take over not only their primary education, but their preschool education because children learn more in the first five years of their life formatively than they will learn the rest of their lives. So there's a push to get a hold of them early and give them whatever foundation the government wants to give them. Under our, now, now, the reason he wanted to do away with family is because family created evil things like capitalism, working hard to earn a living. The harder you work, the better you work, the more you make. Evils like private property ownership, came from families. So if you're going to do away with that stuff and put all of this in the hands of the government, you've got to destroy the family first. Under our present structure, and it's been this way under Republicans and Democrats, okay? Under our present structure, the government will give subsidy checks to single mothers per child that they have. But let that single mother find a man and get married and try to bring her life together into something that would, would, would be fulfilling, and the government will start cutting off that assistance, basically paying them to remain single. That is what socialism looks like. Now, there are some in the world and in America who are pushing this agenda, and they are working with the enemy of the family to do so. It is the enemy's plot because children that come from strong families tend to be more productive and less dependent and harder to control. Are you following this now? The more you take control away from the family unit, the more you put it into the government's hands, then the government dictates what your children become, not you. But know this, God gave stewardship of the children to their parents. Can I get an amen from somebody? Now, the second thing I believe that's destroying family and the culture is this, the promotion of promiscuity. In reading even this morning on some of the people that Karl Marx patterned after, they believed at one time in the world that, that sexuality was just any man, any woman at any time. Everybody had free reign of one another. Kind of sounds like the 60s, doesn't it? Okay. But they believed that marriage was oppressing that free natural expression Sexual promiscuity is rampant in the culture today. It was rampant in the time that the Bible was written, but both men and women are constantly bombarded with sexual temptation, images, and so forth. And this is leading to illegitimate ties that mimic marriage and carry no covenant responsibility. But it's not just adults that's being impacted. Children are being targeted, groomed, and sexualized at an early age. There's a movement now to add to all of the LTBGQ uh, letters to add the minor attracted person to that list. Understand, sexual promiscuity, sexual sin is rampant in the culture. And I wish I could say that Christian families were doing better than other families, but there are times I wonder if that's the truth or not. But the reason is, Satan is taking the attraction that God placed between a man and a woman that, that he intended to be both physical, spiritual, and emotional, and he's making it strictly recreational, and it's destroying the family as God designed it. Sexual immorality is a threat to the family unit. The third thing I see that's a threat to the family unit is on-demand abortion. Now, before I start this one, understand something. What the culture has made into a political issue is really a biblical and a spiritual issue. Okay? There is biblical evidence 
that a child in the womb of his mother is an actual person with a personality given by God. Watch now. God says to the prophet Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So Jeremiah was a spirit being assigned to a body. Are you following this? Pastor Blake did a great sermon on that recently. He's a spirit assigned to a body. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I designated what you were going to be. I set you apart for my purpose. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. The psalmist in Psalm 139 said, Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. No life is illegitimate life. Now listen, if you have ever made this heart-wrenching choice to have an abortion, you need to know something. We serve a loving, merciful, forgiving God that heals and restores and makes all things new. And I love you just like the people who've never made that choice. And God loves you just like the people who never made that choice. But you need to understand something. Everyone must understand it's a person in the womb and not a mass of tissue. If God knew them, then they had assigned personalities. And that makes a person, my friend. According to Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 and 17, out of the list of things that God hates... One of them is hands that shed innocent blood. And you can be no more innocent than to be in the womb of your mother. There's a lot of people touting that gun violence is the number one killer of children in America. It's not. It's abortion. Is anybody praying? Beyond God's prohibition of this is the impact it's having on the family. And this is the part that people won't tell you. I praise God that in 2020, the numbers were significantly lower than those back in 1991. I thank God that progress is being made and children are being spared. But still, 63 plus million children have been aborted since 1973 with Roe v. Wade becoming the law of the land. And one of the communities that has been devastated and almost decimated by on-demand abortion is the African-American community. And it's been on purpose. Racist Margaret Sanger, who started Planned Parenthood, saw African-Americans as a blight on the human condition, as a dark spot, as something... Her goal was to call, if not to eliminate, the African-American population in America. And as a result, Planned Parenthood offices are strategically planted. 95% of them are in walking distance to minority communities. It was a racist plot to begin with. And now, We've quit calling it abortion because that's an ugly term because it deals with the ending of a human life and we begin to call it a woman's right to choose and then they came back with, well, it's a child, not a choice. And now if you'll notice, it's shifted to a woman's right to health care. Listen to me. Listen to me. The African American, American community makes up 14.4% of the American community. Without abortion, those numbers would be somewhere between 21 and 28%. It looks like the plan worked. But I can tell you what, I wonder, did we kill the next Martin Luther King Jr.? Did we kill the next civil rights activist? Did we kill the next great person that would be a great preacher of the gospel or a great missionary to the world? I can tell you this, there are precious babies being lost in America and the preachers of America are complicit in it because when people stand up and preach like this, they think it's political, but I can tell you it's not political, it's in the word. These babies are human beings and we are destroying the family by destroying little human lives. Catch that, understand that. 
The next thing I think that's destroying the family is the redefinition of marriage. We talked about this last week, so I won't stay here long. But realize the only way the earth can be filled with the image of God through the, is through the union of a man and a woman. That's the only way it works. The purpose for marriage was to show the love between Christ and the church and to replenish the earth with the image of God and still biologically that is the only way that it can happen. So if you change the definition of marriage to include other things other than that, then the mission of marriage goes unfulfilled and it's destroying marriage in our nation. Next is gender confusion. Listen to me. Those of you that are truly struggling with your gender identity, you know what I'm gonna say. You know what I'm gonna say by now. God loves you and so does GC Church and so does this pastor. Love you deeply. Believe that God created you and God has a plan for you. And I want you to keep coming to this church. I want you to hear the gospel and I want you to let it work in your heart and change your life just like it's changed my life. But I want you to understand something. Those people that are championing your calls, they are not for you. They are using you in a bigger agenda. Recently, until recently, the American Psychiatric Association, as well as the World Health Organization, labeled gender dysphoria as a mental disorder. Did you know that? It's disappeared from their websites now because now it's a heroic personal choice. But I can tell you, when you start wiping away gender, you, stop, you start wiping away the very relationship God used to establish population in the earth. And, and, and because of that, listen, because of declining birth rates, because of abortion, because of gender dysphoria, because of all of these things, the birth rate is now below the replacement rate. And we are not replenishing the earth with just the number we have right now. Understand, that means families are getting smaller. Families are failing. The next thing I see is the delay of adulthood. Because we've coddled a generation, we've delayed the emotional and psychological development of our children. We don't force them to grow up, so they don't. And as a result, they delay leaving the nest, if at all. Some of their retirement plans is to live with you till you die and then inherit your house and continue to live in something they didn't pay for. But understand, we need to learn a lesson from the mama eagle when she has eaglets. When those babies are coming, she fixes that nest and she turns every little prong downward so that it'll be comfortable and nothing will hurt those little babies. And we are to protect our children when they're young. But when they start growing, and don't get the message, she'll start taking those sprigs and twigs and turning them upwards. So when they sit down, they start getting uncomfortable. And if they don't get the message, she'll just go, boop. We need to love our children enough to just go, boop. You've been here long enough. Grow up, get a job, get married, have some kids, do what you were created to do. Don't sit around and let your life pass you by. But too many times we've coddled them to the place where they just depend on us and they never become self-dependent. They never get a mortgage. They never get a wife. They pass their prime and now children are no longer important to them. And it's killing the family unit. The next thing I see that's killing the family is waning spiritual influence. The missing leadership of parents in the home is rampant and catastrophic. And I'm not just talking about the parents who are spiritually bound battling their own demons. I'm talking about godly parents who become complacent. I'm talking about godly parents who have become like a daisy in their approach to parenting. See, we care now today more about our kids being happy than helping our kids to become holy. We care more that they are at their ball practice when they're supposed to be there than in the house of worship when the doors are open and we're worshiping Jesus. There is little to no intentionality on many parents' parts today as they leave their children to be babysat by electronic devices with no monitoring of the content. And listen, if you're not teaching them, the culture is. The family is failing in America. 
but I have come as one preacher fulfilling my responsibility today to tell you the family doesn't have to fail. God didn't create the family to fail. He created the family to thrive, and Satan may have a plot, but God has a plan. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? Your family doesn't have to become a statistic. I want to show you four things I see in the Bible that will get us started in the right direction on God's plan for the family. First of all, we need marriages that are loving. Ephesians 5, 25 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. We need to see mamas and daddies loving each other with a passion, with a sacrificial love that considers one another before themselves because this whole passage in there begins with submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And what this looks like in marriages is when husbands are properly loving their wives. Satan wants mom and dad to stay divided, to stay fussing and feuding. But remember, he's not just after your marriage, he's after your children. Can I say something to the moms and dads today? Get over whatever you need to get over. Your children are counting on you. And their best shot for becoming the adults that God created them to be is for you to get over your differences with one another, get your counseling, both of you get your heart right with God. Your children are counting on you to shape their lives and you want to give them a good example to follow. It's not just about you. It's about the generations that will follow you. Parents teach your sons and daughters how to love their spouses and set their expectations high for marriage so they don't marry the first bum that comes along. Let them see you love one another at the expense of leaving their little rear ends at home. Dropping them off at grandma's. Is that all right? Any grandmas like spending time with your grandkids? Drop those little financial responsibilities off <laughs> with somebody you can trust and look at them and say, mom and daddy love you, but we also love one another, and tonight ain't about y'all, it's about us. And show them what it's like to passionately love one another. The greatest thing you can do for your children, husbands and wives, is to love one another the way that Christ loves the church and the way the church loves Christ. Make them go, ew. Show them what it's like to be in love. The second plan, part of God's plan, is men who are leading. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as to the Lord. What is the implied there? Spiritual leadership. Okay? For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. At first, this looks like oppressive male privilege, but it is really spiritual responsibility for the condition of the home. Men, you are to take the lead in spiritual matters, and I know it's intimidating because my wife is so much closer to God than I am at times. She's really good at it. I think one of the reasons that God chose men to lead their home spiritually is because we have to have his help. Men, we can't lead without the Lord leading us. And we can't be leaders in our home until we become good followers of Jesus. You're to lead in sacrifice and giving of yourself, your time, and your energies for your family. There was a day when fathers worked too much and they were not available in the home to their wife and to their children. But now that pendulum has swung in America as 6.8 million working age men are not only not working, they're not even looking for work. And the thing about it, they're not staying home and blessing their families either. So what I'm telling you is this, we've got a problem with male leadership in the family in this nation, but this church is not going to beat you up for not doing a good job. In 2025, we're going to help you do a good job, and we're going to tell you on Vision Sunday how we're going to pour into your life and equip you to be the man of God in your home. You are the high priest of your home, men, and it's time you quit shirking that responsibility and being intimidated by it because God created you for it, and if God created you for it, he's going to equip you for it. And if you want to lead well, learn to follow well. I'm getting excited about what's coming in the coming year. See, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, 
God didn't come calling Eve. He said, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? I believe God is saying to the church today, men, where are you? Where are you? I I recently met an incredible couple from California, Bill and Michelle Winder, and God told them to move to Tennessee. They felt like it was the Lord calling them them to move here. And just a few weeks ago, while up on a ladder hanging curtains in their new home, Bill got dizzy on the ladder. And so they went to the emergency room, and when they got the test back, they told him he had about three weeks to live. He had a massive brain tumor and tumors over his body. They had been to our church twice. We heard about what happened, and my my dad and mom went and first visited with them. Kathy and I went and visited with them. Pastor Blake went and visited with them. This past Wednesday, after this major move, Bill went home to be with the Lord. And as I sat there with his new widow that it hadn't really sank in yet, she told me something about her husband. She said Bill was a consummate sailor. He could sail through a hurricane. She said, I remember one time we were out and the water was so rough, we were on somebody else's boat, but everybody wanted Bill to take over because he was such a sailor. But you never usurp another captain's boat. So Bill did nothing until the captain of that boat said, Bill, would you take over? Would you take the helm? Bill took the helm, and she said, he began to guide us through those waters. It leveled out, and he got us safely to shore. You know what I believe that story's about? I believe, I I looked at her, I said, can I tell that story? Because you don't know what I'm preaching on Sunday. I believe God is saying to the men, take the helm of your home. We are in a hurricane in this culture. Everything in the world is stacked against your family. And for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. Stand up at the helm, men. Grab hold of the wheel of your home and start guiding that home in the ways of God. Make it through the hurricane of the culture and get them safely home. The next part of God's plan for the family is parents who are mentoring. Proverbs tells us to train up a child in the way they should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Teach your children by example and instruction. Too many times, the problem is the example don't fit the instruction. And we're left with do as I say, not as I do. But listen to me, modeling and mentoring go together. You can't mentor your children to be people of God unless you're modeling what a Jesus follower looks like. I challenge every parent to take it seriously, mom and dad both, to pour into the spiritual life of your children. Teach them the life-shaping principles of God's word. Teach them the value of his forever family, the church. Show them what it's like to be a Christ follower by example every single day. Modeling and mentoring go together. The only way you ever be a good example as a leader in your home is to become a better Jesus follower. And Kathy and I pray that every day. God make us better Jesus followers so we can be better leaders of people. That's the only way it happens. The last part I want to talk to you about today is this. The last part of God's plan is this children who are honoring honor your father and mother this was the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land my mother used to somewhat quote this scripture to me by this when I was being disrespectful she would say son you're shortening your days (laughs) she sure would I didn't know it's because she's thinking about killing me and telling God I died (laughs) But what she was telling me is that God made you a promise. If you honor your father and mother, he'll bless you with long life in the earth. He'll do things for you. He'll bless you. See, see, God demands honor. 
but parents also have to insist on honor in the home. First of all, we have to conduct ourselves honorably, and then we have to insist on our children honoring the parental leadership because honor for parental leadership and authority will lead to honor for civil authority. If you let your kids say anything they want to to you and with no recourse, don't be surprised when you get a call from the precinct downtown. And they say, we tried to talk him down, but he just wouldn't quit mouthing off, and now he struck an officer, and you need to come pick him up. He's got a court date. You are the primary examples and primary representatives of God in your family. And if you teach your children to respect parental authority, they have a higher chance of respecting civil authority and spiritual authority. And the way that you allow them to treat you will go a long way in how they relate to God in their later life. Moms and dads, you are the evangelists of your home. You are the priests of your home. You are the ministers of your home. But you must insist on your children honoring your leadership. Children, obey your parents. For this pleases the Lord. I didn't know <laughs> that disobedience was an option without penalty. <laughs> I didn't. Because I showed them what I was made of at times, and they showed me what they were made of in return. <laughs> and guess what? They was made of more than I was made of. And it was a blessing to my life. It brought discipline. It helped me to grow up. And to become a man. Now listen, I know a sermon like today, I'm just gonna come down here with you and the camera people are going crazy. I know a message like today can heap guilt on people. I get that. But guilt comes from the enemy. What God wants us to experience is Holy Spirit conviction. The conviction to change. And here's the thing, it is never too late to impact the future of your family. My kids are grown. I taught them the ways of God, and they rebelled, but guess what? It didn't leave them. That's why they couldn't leave it. Everywhere they go, it's gone with them, and that seed you planted is gonna break through ground one day and spring up in life, and guess what? They're gonna come home to Jesus. That's what the Bible tells us. They will not depart from it because it goes with them. Hold on to your hope. But it begins with a simple decision on our part for this moment in this day. You know, when Joshua saw that the children of Israel who had left the bondage of Egypt started acting like Egyptians again, they had brought some things with them from their slave life into their free life. They had gods and idols with them. And one of the problems in leading our homes is we brought things from our old life, our slave life, to sin into our new free life. And Joshua looks at the nation as he's getting ready to, this was his swan song. This was all he had to say. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me, and my house. I've come to say to somebody this morning, but as for me and my house, where are you at, parents? As for me and my house. As for me and my house. Where are you at, daddy? As for me and my house. Where are you at, mama? As for me and my house. Where are you at, grandparents? As for me and my house. Where are you at, aunt and uncle? As for me and my house. I say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord come and give God